All right, well, we'll get started, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Rachel, who we have, this is maybe the first time we saw each other in person. I know. We've been collaborating on Zoom for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, but Rachel's the research director at Take This, which is a really important nonprofit in the game space, does work a lot with industry. Um, psychologist by training, excellent human being. <laughs> Um, and very good at what I would call translational research, is, which is trying to take kind of theoretical academic research and make it legible for people in the industry. So really trying to create impact through working with developers on the ground, doing work around kind of games. And she's been moved into the extremism space. She's a pioneer in this work, um, doing a lot of very important stuff and is kind of like garnering more and more attention in terms of attention in terms of how important this work is. So we're looking forward to hearing oh, Thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming um, to my talk, Totally Not Radical Man, Games and Extremism. It's not the easiest talk to attend on a Friday afternoon, but I'm grateful that you all have come. Um, I had a lovely introduction, but this is always part of the slide deck. I am the research director of Take This. I'm a science content uh, creator on YouTube, where I do a lot of that translation work. Um, and if you follow me on social media, you know if I don't mention The Witcher, it's not a talk of mine. Um, I'm a passionate mental health advocate, and I am generally a proponent of games as tools for mental wellness. Although obviously this work in extremism kind of departs a bit from that. Now, if you're not familiar with Take This, uh, we are a mental health nonprofit, actually the oldest mental health nonprofit in the space. And we're in this very interesting boundary between we work with gaming communities, but we also work with the industry. So we advocate in both spaces. And our general remit is to destigmatize mental health challenges and provide mental health information and support. So we're going to take some broad strokes to games and extremism today because I realize that it's maybe a little niche and not everybody is as familiar with this area of research as I am. Um, so like any good academic, I'm going to start with definitions and then I'm going to give a really kind of TLDR about what we know about games and extremism. Then I'm going to give the world premiere of some new data, which is always tasty and exciting. Um, and then after I take you down, I promise to bring you back up with the uh, what do we do about it at the end. So starting with definitions, so extremism is the advocacy of extreme views. It includes the belief that your success, your in-group success is, uh, or survival is dependent upon the need for hostile action for an outgroup. So examples include misogyny, racism, white nationalism. I've made a little example here, like a hatred for robots, which will make, be more clear in a minute, um, but it's about the advocacy of extreme views. Whereas radicalization is the escalation of an in-group um, idea of increasingly negative views and the endorsement of need for hostile action. So it's taking it one step further. So to put the other way, extremism is the advocacy of extreme views. Radicalization is when they become more extreme and increasingly orient towards hostile, negative, and violent action. Now, actual violent action, that's terrorism. That would be another, another word here. That's the actual or threatened use of violence. But just for our purposes, radicalization is the escalation of thoughts um, towards increasing need for violence for your own group's survival. So what do we know about this in games? We know that the internet has a history of being a gateway for communities devoted to extremist movements. We've seen this over you know, a long time since the advent of the internet, maybe. We see it in online forums, we see it on social media, we see it on YouTube. But in the last few years, there's been growing concern specifically about extremism in gaming spaces. And the concern seems largely centered on this idea that extremists are using the breadth of population that are engaged in games to propagate um, uh, their propaganda and radicalize and mobilize and signal and network and all of these things. So we see this concern from the media. This image comes from a Wired article that actually made it to the print magazine of that month from 2021 called How Roblox Became a Playground for um, Virtual Fascists. But we also see it in the government. So the Department of Homeland Security, the UN Office for Counterterrorism, they both in the last few years held summits specifically about games and extremism. 
But a lot of what we know about games and extremism today is really just the idea that it exists, that it is present in these spaces, um, and also game adjacent spaces. So when I say the term game adjacent spaces, it's any space that's not the game itself, but it's kind of supplementary or complementary to it. So this would be like Discord, which is a chat server, or Twitch, which is a live streaming platform. So just to give like a really fast rundown of what we know about its existence, um, this work comes from the ISD. They found that Discord, which is one of the most popular third party chat servers for gaming communities, serves as a hub for right wing socializing. And they specifically noted that gaming was referenced in cultural terms as a way to find a common ground with other people, which becomes more relevant later. Steam, which is an online platform where you can buy, sell, and trade and create games, has been found to house a range of servers that are created by far-right and neo-Nazi groups. Then there's uh, Twitch, which is an online streaming platform, and you can find uh, support for right-wing ideologies with relative ease. This includes things like playing very popular games to bring people in and then verbally overlaying with some kind of extremist rhetoric, or also playing bespoke games that are made for the purpose of propagation of extremist rhetoric. Um, it also includes using the platform itself as kind of its modality to troll and spew hate through things like hate rating. As I just kind of mentioned, there are games created specifically for the propagation of extremist ideology. Um, one example is a game called Hatred, which is still available for purchase on Steam. It's um, an awful game, but it's described as a genocide crusade simulation game. Um, there's also the modification of games that already exist to kind of represent extreme ideologies, for instance, taking the popular game Civilization and modifying it so you play a Hitler-led Germany, for example. And in terms of prevalence and exposure, um, in 2019, the ADL published a report that said one in four or 23% of game players are exposed to white supremacist ideology in game, which is an extreme ideology. Um, it's also important to note that the ADL found that this was regardless of platform. So the most explicit forms were found across PC, mobile, and um, console. It wasn't just in like one place or another. So taking this all together, we see that there's ample evidence to indicate that extremist ideology, propaganda, and potentially recruitment exists in gaming and gaming adjacent spaces. We see it and it is present. Um, but the way that extremism is presented in these spaces does vary. It can be community building, it could be propaganda dissemination, it could be extremists making their own games. And if you wanna deep dive into that landscape a bit more, there's this really great paper published by some people in this room that just came out very recently um, that I cannot recommend enough that provides a really a great overview of how and, and why, not really why, how games are being used uh, specifically from the right ring to um, disseminate propaganda and, and all those fun things. Check it out. I can't recommend it enough. But when I talk about the landscape of games, I'm not interested in just the presence. I'm interested in why. Why are games being used? Is there something unique about them as shared, playful, and interactive spaces? Why are they uniquely poised, I would argue, in the internet space to be leveraged and used in this way? So of all the talks I've given and the webinars I've attended, uh, there's very little talk about why, um, why it might be unique. Uh, with one notable exception, again, someone in this room, it's like you guys are doing the good work here. Um, Constance gave a great talk at Games for Change, and it was actually the first time I'd seen on a main stage somebody talking about the ecosphere and all of the different cultural elements that are part of why games are particularly concerning as space is being leveraged um, for radicalization and recruitment. So to that end, I want to talk about three things that I believe are potential vulnerabilities of gaming spaces. I'm going to give a TLDR for the sake of time. Happy to talk about them more in depth at a later time. So it's social environment, content and culture, and identity. The first thing we have to talk about is the social environment of games. So games are stereotyped as being havens for disaffected youth. And we know from demographic reports that there's a much more diverse picture of who plays games. But we can all agree that people turn to online games. There is a motivation, a social motivation of some kind as to why people are playing online games, whether it's about being alone together or whether it's about being actively with other people. There is a motivation for a social community when you are playing online games. And while social community can be found on the internet in all different spaces, the community in games are different. Friendships that form in games tend to be close and long lasting and tight knit, whereas other friendships on the internet tend to be kind of loosey goosey, like loose and diffuse and, and weaker ties. 
Research has found between 40 and 70% of game players say that they tell their online gaming friends things they have not told their offline friends, which indicates that these are close, trusted social and emotional bonds that are being formed here. Now, games can foster the formation of close bonds because they are a shared activity and essentially friendships form backwards. They're what we call emotionally jump-started. So you get to trust someone in the beginning and then slowly get to know them. Whereas in an offline context, you slowly get to know someone and learn if you can trust them. So if I'm playing with someone and they help me kill the dragon, I like them, I trust them, I don't know anything about them, right? But I, I know I like them and I have a foundational level of trust. Whereas if you don't help me or you actively inhibit me from doing it, I don't like you and I don't want anything to do with you. The other thing to note is the social and emotional impact of these friendships, which was kind of highlighted by those statistics I gave about the close emotional bonds, but Here's a quote from some 2021 work. It says, online friendships enhance feelings of belonging driven by trust, that level of trust, and players feel a deeper sense of belonging and more accepted by their gaming community than they are offline. And this is just one of many studies that has come to a similar conclusion. Now, the emotionally jumpstarted relationship building, this foundational level of trust, this social motivation to play, the specific combination of social qualities which makes games wonderful is also a vulnerability for recruitment for extremist causes. And I'm gonna illustrate for uh, with an example here. This is taken from that Wired article. It says, here's one version of how far-right recruitment is supposed to work. Bobby queues up for a Fortnite match and gets paired with big bad skinhead Ryland. Ryland has between two and 20 minutes to make his pitch to Bobby over voice or text chat before enemy player Sally shotguns them both in the face. If Ryland's vibe is intriguing, maybe Bobby accepts his Fortnite request. They catch um, some more games and continue their friendship over Discord. And over time, weeks or months, Ryland normalizes extremist ideology for Bobby, and eventually the kid becomes radicalized. So in this example, we see how the social environment can be leveraged in this example to Ryland's advantage. He shows his prowess in a Fortnite match. He helps him you know, kill the enemy. Trust is established. After a few matches, he says, hey, I have some other really cool people over here. Why don't we move you over here into this other group that is probably already more radicalized? If you trust me, you'll probably trust them. They enmesh them in this community and he has a sense of belonging and they spend more time together. And as it says in this quote, eventually the kid becomes radicalized. And this is the unique dynamic that games have to offer. The shared, exciting, trust building exercises, social experiences structure the social environment and they guide the interpersonal dynamics. To be clear, this is not just a hypothetical. This article came out in 2022 looking at two police reports of 14 year olds who were radicalized in video games. Um, and I wanna share a little bit of the summary of one of the uh, people that they talk about. He's referred to as person A. Uh, he established a friendship with a person, presumably age 16, because it's the internet and you never know, uh, through a shared interest in playing a historic strategy simulation game focusing on the second world war on the gaming platform, Roblox. The friendship between the two was intensified on Discord. They met in the game, they just moved to another space. They attempted to involve him in discussions about politics and ideology and therefore radicalize him as well as to bring him to offline behavioral changes or certain actions. Specifically, he was told to shout the Hitler salute in school or at home, which he did, and thereby cause suspicion about a potential radicalization among his teachers. Now, the article goes on to say the next thing they asked of him was to go into the real world and commit violence. And luckily, this 14 year old realized that that was one step too far. And he went to the police and said, I think something weird is happening here. And that's how they, they found that out. Not everybody is going to be so cognizant of what is happening in these relationships. And it's interesting, too, because in the interview, he said he didn't actually want to do the Nazi salute, but this was his group and he felt a sense of belonging and he wanted them to be happy and like him. And that's why he did it. So this takes us to the second vulnerability, which is content. Uh, I have a lot of things listed here, othering, ethnocentrism, gamification, aesthetics, and narrative. And I think it's important to understand that with games, it's not just the social environment that's being leveraged, although that's a really important piece, but one I think we're starting to make some progress on better understanding. But content is also important. And earlier this week, I was at a different conference and somebody described it as the mood music of radicalization, which I think is actually the, a, good, a good way to put it. So the first concept is othering. It's classic us versus them, interpersonal dynamics. You know, it's me who's similar and you, everyone who else is not similar. And if someone is experiencing marginalization in their daily lives and they turn to games, you know, and gaming cultures for a place to find a sense of belonging, 
If they're entering in a space that have heavy handed us for some dynamics that can not only solidify group identities, um, but it can also it can solidify group identities. Oh, yeah, that are particularly entrenched in gamer cultures. So it's not just us versus them in terms of me versus the bad guy. It's us versus them versus gamers versus everyone. And we all know the gamer identity is very entrenched in the cisgender white male um, elements. Us, the hardcore male gamer, them, everyone else. Now, this isn't unique to the social group of gamers, um, but when you combine the foundational sense of belonging, the sense of trust, it could be potentially more impactful when you start to talk about us versus them in these specific contexts, which is then reinforced uh, by the content and mechanics of the games themselves. These have powerful othering processes, you know, in realistic war games, for instance, there's often ethnocentric uh, view of the world that's presented and it marginalized those anyone who's not like you. We see this in off the shelf titles. We also see this in the extreme example I gave earlier of hatred that bespoke game that's basically the entire mechanic of the game is an us versus them. And this is not me saying games shouldn't have us versus them dynamics. I'm just saying it's the mood music, right, of radicalization that kind of adds to further leverage um, the propagation of these ideas. And then there's visual elements. And I always talk about Far Cry 5 um, because it's just a good example. If you're not familiar with this game, basically there's a doomsday cult. That's who they are. They're intended to be villainous, but they have highly stylized aesthetics. They have like a catchy theme song. Um, they have you know rhetoric kind of around them that is supposed to be bad, but it's not like super clear if they're actually bad. And it has become really cut and paste propaganda um, for people who want to propagate this idea of white nationalism. And we know that because we see it, because it's copied and pasted into propaganda uh, for white nationalism. This is taken uh, from a Tumblr that was full of different forms of propaganda. And this is Joseph Seed. He's the main bad guy in Far Cry 5. He's saying, join me and your eyes shall be open, which is a line from the game. You see the nuclear bomb exploding behind him, which is also imagery um, from the game. We also see it in game reviews. Um, the top guy says, not gonna lie, this game is super fantastic for radicalizing American youth. And the guy at the bottom says, Joseph Seed was right, the collapse is upon us. So we know that games are being used as cultural currency. Um, and if the narratives kind of align with these ideas, that creates a really easy kind of machine of propaganda. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of content is this idea of gamification of violent extremism. And this is adapting uh, game-like elements to real world violence. So this is an article from GNET and they were talking about specifically the Christchurch attack and the way in which the visual choreography of the event took place, the way that the camera was placed, the way that um, multiple weapons were used. And the reason I bring this up is because I wanted to demonstrate that it's not just that a game can be used to inspire change and propaganda, but it's also being retroactively used the other way around um, to inspire the way that the visual aesthetics are being shown um, in real world acts of terrorism. So that's content. And then I wanna talk about culture and identity and culture and identity not only underpins these first two um, areas that I talked about, social environment and content, um, but it's also my area of expertise. So I like talking about it. And it's also really what underpins why there is such a great concern as games for incubators for extremist ideology. So video games and, and gamer cultures, gamer identities really kind of first started emerging in the late 1970s when arcades became popularized and the term gamer was really made to establish the us versus them, the us, the ones in the dimly lit arcades and them, everyone else. And you'll notice I'm saying gamer and gamer cultures because this isn't just about people who play games. My mom plays Wordle very competitively uh, every day. Um, really, I don't do it with her anymore. Um, and she would never call herself a gamer, ever, ever. I would call myself a gamer and I haven't played a game in a long time because I have small children and no time. Um, so a player is a temporary functional status that you have when you're actually playing. A gamer is a concept that comprises longtime aspects of your self-construction, your self-perception, how you perceive yourself in the world, um, in your own social group, but also in comparison to others. So we all have a lot of social identities and these identities 
are important. Gamer identities specifically have been associated with a range of positive mental health outcomes, um, a greater sense of belonging, lower sense of loneliness, you know, our social groups give our lives meaning. It's also been associated with greater engagement in games themselves, like longer playtime. But the caveat that comes with gamer identities is that they are generally seen as more exclusionary than inclusionary and have been come to be called toxic. You may have heard the phrase like toxic gamer cultures. So this was talked about um, by Brianna Wu several years ago. She says, the gaming world is thronged by misogynists and racists who feel free to advocate harm against anyone who's not like them. And this is just one part of a much longer quote, um, but I think it really gets at the heart of what we're calling toxic gamer cultures, which are cultures of misogyny, racism, and hate, where these things are not only happening, but these things are normalized behavior. And they really are normalized. Um, this is data from 2021. It looked at all forms of what I call dark participation. These were the three most extreme kind of forms that I looked at, sexual harassment, hate speech, and violent threats. In blue is directly experienced. So that means they were the direct target of this action. And orange is that they witnessed it. And you can see that in many cases, it is the norm and not the exception. But what does toxic gamer culture have to do with extremism? A lot, actually. Uh, first, we, uh, research has found that participation in these kinds of activities is associated with an increased risk of being persuaded by far right propaganda specifically. So being entrenched in a culture that normalizes hate increases the likelihood that you too may choose to adopt or participate in this behavior. And participation can lead you to more extreme forms of this behavior, both in and out of game. And we know from years of psychological research that the nature of the environment around us impacts the way we see and interact with the world. And the analogy I always like to give is it's like when your mom says, don't hang out with the kids smoking behind the gym, because the people that you're with change the way that you see and interact with the world. We also see a normalization of extremist language kind of embedded in this culture of a normalization of hate and harassment. So this was a paper published in 2022. It was a collaboration with Take This, Middlebury, ADL, and Gamer Safer. We looked at 1.4 million chat log messages, and we found the normalization of extreme language in gaming spaces that were previously only affiliated with very kind of hardened hate groups. So they weren't being used in the same way. They were being used very casually, but the words that were being used were not common words, words I had never heard of until I, I did this study. Um, and a few years ago back, you would have only seen it in like the dark corners of 4chan. So it's mitigating its way and moving its way back uh, into gamer cultures. Interestingly, hateful messages were also 21% more likely to occur in public chat than private chat, whereas highly sexualized language was more likely to occur in private chat, not public chat. Further pointing to this idea that there's a normalization or some kind of acceptance of hateful language being used in public spaces um, when it comes to games. We've also seen gamer identities um, reflecting extremist ideologies. So this is some work that I did with the University of Texas. It was published last year in collaboration with Bill Swan and Alexi Martel. And we looked at this concept called identity fusion. So we have our individual identities and our social identities and they tend to be separate, but sometimes the borders become more porous and they fuse together. And the best example I can give is um, military identities. My dad was a Marine, you know, Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. There's no tying out what part of my dad is that Marine identity and what part is any other part of his identity. And what's really interesting about when identities fuse is that you're more likely to self-sacrifice in service of the group. So traditionally, fusion happens when people have a deep emotional bond to their social group. It tends to form over time. It's from shared stressful activities, shared norms. See, all of these things sound kind of familiar because all of these things are things that also happen in games. So we looked at identity fusion among games to see what kind of profile it would reflect. And what we found is that not only identity with gamers exists, identity fusion with gamer cultures exists, it reflects what you would expect to be reflective of a toxic gamer culture or more extreme ideologies. So the willingness to fight or die, which to be clear, that's the measure of fusion, willing to sacrifice yourself for group goals, uh, recent aggressive behaviors, Machiavellianism, which is a personality trait characterized by being deceitful and cynical and lacking morality, uh, narcissism, psychopathy, which was measured as a lack of empathy, racism, sexism, and it says alt-right identity, but it should say white nationalist identity because the question was literally like, do you espouse beliefs associated with white nationalism? I remember my co-author was like, did you really ask that? And people said, yes, <laughs> I don't know, they did. Um, 
It's also interesting to note that age, gender, and years gaming didn't have an effect, but playtime did. And these effects were also magnified among people who said they primarily played online multiplayer versus offline single player. So we hypothesize that the time gaming has to do more with exposure to the gaming social environment rather than the content itself. So again, the more time you're spending engaged and immersed in the cultures, the greater likelihood you are to be exposed to these ideologies, the more opportunity you have to internalize these beliefs and then endorse these beliefs, racism, sexism. So when it's taken all together, what I kind of tie it up in a bow and, and spit out is I believe that digital games are performing a socializing function in the wider context of radicalization as cultural assets have influenced. Their cultural breadth is being leveraged as we see in propaganda. The social environment, the unique social environment is being leveraged for radicalization and recruitment. They're being uniquely leveraged to normalize, desensitize and mobilize. We know that it's happening across platforms, across age, across gender. And why is this a problem? <laughs> when you normalize hate in one space, it normalizes hate in all spaces. This is not magically contained within the four walls of our digital playgrounds. And we saw this specifically with Gamergate in 2014, where online hate transcended into offline violence. Now you may be saying, you, are you being dramatic? <laughs> is this really a problem? Because whenever I have this conversation, some people say, but you know, it's just like the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Like, should we really be putting our efforts and our time into discussing this problem? But I am nothing but a woman of science and I came with numbers to show you scale. Mm -hmm. This comes from 2014 when there was a head of trust and safety at Twitter. Um, and their quote was, for us edge cases, those rare situations that are unlikely to occur, they are more like norms. Let's say 99.99% of tweets pose no risk to anyone. There's no threat involved. After you take out the 99.999%, the tiny percentage of tweets remaining works out to 150,000 per month. The sheer scale of what we're dealing with makes for a challenge. Now, Google tells me in 2014, Twitter had 200 million users. There are 3 billion gamers uh, actively playing. So the 0.001 is a significant problem. Which takes us to new data, which specifically builds on this point of scope. <clears throat> so I am about eight months into a two-year project that is funded by the Department of Homeland Security with a very long title, Disrupting Video Games Based Radicalization Through Collaborative Cross-Sector Networks. Um, these are some of the lovely people that I work with. Um, and what I'm going to present to you today is the work happening in this first work stream, which is Gamer Surveys. The primary um, goal of Gamer Surveys is to look at prevalence, the nature and scope of what we're even talking about when it comes to extremism, uh, and also to do some more identity fusion work. We're also currently running the Game Dem Interviews, which is about finding tools to better mitigate this, um, this problem, scoring problem. All right, so fresh data. I showed you prevalence earlier. So we replicated that dark participation work, but we added some new categories. Um, we added um, incitement of violence and hate rating. And again, direct target is in blue and witnessed is in orange. And you can again see that it is far more the, uh, far lower than before, but the witnessing is more the norm than the exception. You also see that one in four said they have been direct targets of incitement of violence, which was defined as speech words or behaviors that encourages the immediate risk of harm to another person. So 25% say they have been the direct target of that kind of speech words or behaviors. Notably, we also asked where this is happening, because there seems to be a lot of debate of like, is it happening in the game? Is it happening in a third party platform? Like, where is this actually being experienced? And 72% said that these experiences have happened in game exclusively. 20% said in game and game adjacent, which I think is really important when we talk about moderation strategies and where like the effort should be should be led is understanding where this is taking place. And for me, that 72% say it's happening in game. Um, these more extreme forms of extremist behaviors and ideologies really points to either the ineffectiveness or the underutilization or both of the moderation efforts that we currently have in place, the reactive moderation efforts that we have in place. We also looked at what kind of ideologies are being expressed. Um, <clears throat> again, direct target in blue and witness in orange. So misogyny, racism, and anti-LGBTQIA are in the running for the most frequently witnessed. But in terms of direct target, nearly half of all participants say they've been the direct target of misogyny and anti-LGBTQIA sentiment. Racism, one in four. 
White nationalism and anti-government was one in three, which honestly surprised me. For someone who studies this, I was like, that's high. Like, that's really high that one in three people say that they have witnessed white nationalist sentiment um, being expressed in gaming spaces. And Islamism was one in four. Then pointing to the normalization, we took these same categories and said, do you think that these things, enter word here, are embedded in gamer cultures? Do you think they are fixed and deeply within? And this is the percentage of people who said yes. So misogyny, 75%, racism, 60, anti-LGBTQ, 60. White nationalism, 40% say that is a embedded feature of gaming cultures. Anti-government Islamism at about 20%, which again goes back to this idea of toxic gamer culture. Now, one more thing we asked, in addition to this was about embedded, we also asked, do you think that these behaviors are culturally justified? Is it justified that this is part of the culture and it's just an experience that you're going to experience uh, being in a gaming space? And we purposefully left these questions more broad. We said, do you think toxic behavior or do you think hateful behavior is culturally justified? And this is the percentage of people who said yes, which again goes back to this normalization of hate and harassment in these spaces. Well, I told you I was going to take you down, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but we're going to go back up. Um, what do we do about it? What can we do about games being cultural assets of influence? What can we do about our ineffectiveness to moderate these behaviors? Um, what hope is there? Now, there's a lot of things we can do. And when I originally drafted this talk, I was kind of going to go point by point and talk about them. But I realized I have a lot of researchers here, and I have a lot of practitioners here, and, and I didn't want to necessarily fall down into this rabbit hole. But basically, the TLDR is that you have to tailor the solution to the problem. So social environment, we can talk about community management and proactive you know, moderation content. We can talk about safety by design, digital thriving. Um, culture and identity, my colleague Alex Newhouse and I have long been on the soapbox of a network moderation, which is moderating people in clusters of, of groups versus like the whack-a-mole of keyword lists, like changing the way we're doing uh, proactive moderation. And several of these things we talked about in our GDC talk. So if you're interested in any of these, I can point you to that. Um, but what I hope to convey from that is that it takes a lot. It takes a lot of different stakeholders. It takes a lot of different pieces and a lot of different approaches because changing culture is slow, multifaceted problem. Now, before I go, I wanted to make one more side point about my favorite um, member of the Captain Planet team, which is Earth Power, um, obviously, and that's the researchers here. So when we're talking about researchers in this space, we have to talk about researcher safety because working in this space comes with risks. And if we're going to continue to do research in this space, which we're doing a lot of it here, I think it's really important to publicly advocate um, for ways in which we can keep ourselves and new researchers in this space safe. So there was this Vox poll article that came out. Um, I did a panel on it with Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, who's one of the authors, and it was specifically focused on researchers who are studying extremism and terrorism. But I do think that it is more ubiquitous. The, the takeaways can be applied to really anybody who's spending time in the digital space, which I feel like is becoming increasingly more of us. So the risks to consider were threefold, external, internal, and professional. External are the things, the harms caused by third parties. So threats of physical harm, gender identity-based harm, you know, just like the general term of online harassment. And, you know, in the best of days, if you go into a gaming space, you might experience these. But if you're a researcher going around poking your finger, you're probably going to also experience it, experience these, probably at an escalated, escalated rate. Now, the external harms feed the internal harms, um, which are the psychological or emotional issues that you can develop over time. They're a direct result of the external harms. This can be short-term isolation withdrawal. It could be long-term uh, depression or post-traumatic stress disorder symptomology. Now, what I found really interesting is they talked about external internal harms combining and becoming professional harms, um, which leads to a lack of visibility. So online harassment and the um, repercussions, the internal harms that come from that can lead a person to pull away from being engaged in public spaces, talking to reporters, doing talks like this, wanting to be visible at all uh, in this space. And it leads to um, the most harm for early career scholars and the people with the, with the least power uh, in this space. So I think what's important to take away here is that online and offline is a false dichotomy, right? And what we're experiencing online um, impacts us offline 
and their real harms and the other way around. And it's important to know that these are harms that you can experience in this space. How do we know that? Because we should be doing things like informed consent. Um, in this article, many researchers said they had zero idea of what they were going to encounter when they started studying in this space. They weren't told anything about their potential harms or how to mitigate them or what support there was for them. 26% said they wanted explicit written guidance on what to expect in terms of potential harms, potential support, where to go. The second thing they talked about is boundary setting. And I think boundary setting is really difficult, especially in games, because a lot of us get into games because we love games. And as much as I like to say, playing The Witcher 3 is work, kind of work, sort of. Um, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out like where those boundaries are. So one thing going forward is to support researchers about physical boundaries. If you're working from home, making sure your work is happening in another room, your physical safety boundaries. How do you keep your personal information off the internet? What are your psychological boundaries? One of the things they talked about here is for people looking at terroristic content, things like setting a timer, like literally don't look at this for more than 20 minutes at a time. It is not good for you uh, and things like that. And I, with that, I want to do a small plug for Tall Poppy, which um, is what we use at Take This. Um, they, they do teachings. They do active um, support if you think that something specific is going to happen. Um, and they provide a lot of information about how to keep your personal information safe. Um, so highly recommend if you're working in any kind of digital space to, to check them out. And these two points really tie into the last point, which is institutionalized support. 31% of researchers in this report said they wanted a formalized support network um, of other people in the field um, and also of resources. They also frequently noted, and I want to get the quote right because it's a little heartbreaking, that institutions frequently fail to regard online spaces as valid research locations needing researcher protection. So several people said they experienced real harms. These are people who are studying online extremism and terrorism. They experienced real harms from the content they were seeing day in and day out. And they went for help. And they said, we can't help you because online harms are not real harms. And we don't have anything for you, uh, which is failing everybody working in this space. So <laughs> that's it. Um, it does feel like this sometimes, but we know that it's it's not okay, right? And we are there is hope. I'm going to end on something hopeful um, because there is progress being made. That this is not okay. Also, if anyone gets this reference, we should be best friends. Um, it's not okay. It's not fine. I see at least one person gets it. Um, or you know, this is not the way. There's a better reference for the for the younger generation in the audience. Hate and extremism may be normalized, but it certainly certainly doesn't need to be this way. We are understanding the landscape. We are developing top-down solutions. We're having better reactive um, moderation, voice moderation, for instance. Um, through our DHS work, we're funding tools to have better reactive uh, moderation. We're also having proactive moderation. People are talking a lot about digital thriving and safety by design, and those conversations are starting to happen. The Fair Play Alliance released their digital thriving playbook at GDC this year, which is fantastic if you're on the design side. Uh, the digital thriving playbook, I highly recommend. And then lastly, we're starting to talk about researcher um, safety. There's been a boom of research in this area. It's no longer like this black box that we aren't talking about. And then we're we'll also start talking about how to do it safely and sustainably. So thank you for coming to this talk. We have time for questions. Rhea is really wanting to ask the first one. I can see her. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you're gonna call me out. Yeah. Um, what one? Wonderful, love you talking Thank about you. their war your, um, I wouldn't let you down. I wouldn't let you down. But um, I do have a question about like you know you make a really good point about how these aren't isolated things. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, gaming culture like really video games. You mentioned GamerGate as an example of real life implications of toxic culture. Do you think that expands outside of gaming, or rather, I I'm hypothesizing like there's a lot um games can kind of be seen as like third spaces for people like possibly like in tech and stem like a lot of people in tech and stem play video games do you think that um there are implications in those spaces as well because of the toxicity of gaming yeah that's a great point 
Uh, thank you for that question. I think so. Um, I, I was telling them at lunch earlier that I we did a study looking at harassment of game developers, game makers online. And we're talking about, is it like a, a circle that feeds into each other? Is it gaming culture think makes it okay to harass game devs? Or is it like game dev, de game dev tech culture that feeds into gamer culture? So yeah, I think it is reflective. I actually, one of the things that I wanted to do with this project with Logically, Logically is an AI um, company that can do massive amounts of data analysis and scraping. And so we wanna see what are the prevalence of these different extreme beliefs being shared across different spaces, like Reddit, certain Reddit subreddits versus games versus Steam forums, that's more still games, but like how can we see how it's actually more of like a bigger circle than just games itself. But I do think that the social connections made in games is unique for the recruitment and radicalization, but it may also be just like this general sentiment could be part of a wider ecosystem. So, thanks. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question as well. Um, I think based on the research you showed here, at least some portion of uh, gamers believe that it is in some way morally justifiable mm -hmm. to engage in toxic behavior or negatively interact with other players. Um, if if we're regarding gamer culture as a culture, then how do we overcome that sort of cultural ethical boundary where a good portion of the mm -hmm. group of people believe that this is justifiable while the greater community of people might not? A good point. Uh, good question. Just because you believe it's normalized doesn't necessarily mean you endorse it as something that you want to accept, but maybe are resigned to accept. I mean, my solution in terms of culture change has always been it has to come from the bottom up rather than the top down. It can't just be like the ban hammer. That that's that not the solution of culture change. It's about you know raising the the new generation up or doing some kind of digital literacy to understand like this is actually harmful. Like hate speech is harmful. And it causes mental health repercussions to the people who are directly targeted and the people who are witnessing it, um, which isn't research I presented here, but there is research to support that. So yeah, it's a fine, it's a fine line, right? But we at the end of the day, I think we all just want spaces where we can all feel that we can go and, and spend time in a safe way that isn't going to negatively impact um, our lives. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Uh, <laughs> I have two little questions. Yes. Um, one was in the work you presented on identity exclusion. Yes. You that you, um, I, you I can hear you. I just want to see you. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that um, gender and age were not significant. Yeah. They didn't significantly associate with whether identity was happen. And I was a little surprised by that. Just based yes. on the kind of, you know, common narrative of, or the narrative that you invoked, right? Of like the younger boy who was brought into this. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to see if you could reflect a little bit. On yes. That. And then the second question was, and if, if you, I just wanted to give you a little more space to talk about this idea of network validation. Yes. Not oh, perfect. Okay. Yes. Um, I may have misspoke in giving the impression that it is the young boy. That is the stereotype that it is the young boy. Um, but there's not evidence to suggest that it is only the young boy. Um, and also there's not evidence to suggest that it's only young people. I was actually talking about Mimi with this uh, earlier, that there's this idea that people are going into just radicalized younger users, which while that is a target because they tend to be more susceptible to these kind of messaging, there's also direct efforts to radicalize older people with means and ways. So it's not like it's they only want a certain person. They, they want all the people with all the different resources and all the different ways. So I, I probably misspoke. Um, for, for that, but that is the stereotype and the perception. Okay, no, I, yeah, yeah, I just want to be clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, network moderation, very cool. So, Alex Newhouse, who is my colleague at Middlebury, um, he has an expertise in counterterrorism in digital spaces. And we presented this work at GDC 2021, where he went into Roblox. Roblox has an open API, and he looked for groups that had names of identifiable and certified terroristic organizations. So, names that are very clearly associated with certain designated terrorist groups and he maps them he maps their connections because you can see how one group is connected or, or affiliated with another and with not a lot of effort he had quite a big map and the idea is if you know that the if you then deep dive and actually look at the people who are in there, it's very clear that these people are affiliated with this group it's they have the iconography they have the user like there's no question that these people are affiliated with the group 
So network moderation would be about taking down the network instead of waiting for them to say a word that's on the ban list and plucking out the one person. And it's, it's still a reactive system, but it's much more effective if, for culture change, for taking out an entire group of them at once, you know, seven, eight, 900 users, one of the ones he mapped out was about 900 users, taking all of them out at once um, versus waiting for a report or, or an infraction. But the GDC um, video is in the vault. So if you're interested, you can access it. Yes. So do we know much about um, how many game companies even have policies that would, yeah. um, that would enable them to go in and do that kind of network moderation, even in like the, the case of like a known extremist organization with clear evidence that it is indeed an affiliated mm -hmm. group? I mean, I'm just generally thinking about sort of industry response. How many of them consider that actionable? It's a good question. I couldn't say how many consider it actionable, but how many people actually have it as like a breach of their terms of service? It's my understanding there's only one and it's Roblox. Yeah. Can I also ask you, I know that um, there are distinctions where like in the US, uh, you know, hate speech is really not considered yeah. actionable, except under very, yes. very narrow conditions. Just thinking a little bit about like why, why we don't have more sort of policies and governmental intervention in this kind of thing. Yeah, it's often my question. Um, I was at a multinational event about extremism and they were people the americans were there the new zealanders were there the australians were there the dutch were there and it was interesting because from a global perspective and uh, the american take on it was very different from everyone else so one example was there was a youtube video that had clips of mass shootings clipped together with this like voiceover of kind of like call to arms and this is great and let's all do this. And, and that was like kind of the voiceover. And the Americans were saying, well, we rely on the terms of service of YouTube to take that down because it's freedom of speech. And then the New Zealanders were next to me and they're like, we, we take that down. Like, we don't. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting that the different perspectives, right? So from government perspective, it seems to be a reliance on the company's terms of service. Whereas in other countries, it's not. Right, it's not let us up to. So then, then you get in the debate of like whose responsibility is it? Where? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. That was so fascinating. And um, I had a question, kind of building on the lack of governmental policy. Can you said something that will be really important in like addressing this and kind of like taking it down from the bottom up yeah. is having like the the digital literacy and having proof that this you know these online actions are actually harmful. Yeah. Um, but another part of that, I think, is also spreading the message to gamers. Like, that's a part of the game's responsibility and, like you said, network moderation. Um, but what do you think is going to be the space where that gets out? Because a lot of the mm -hmm. time, like, it is younger gamers who might be learning online um, yeah. things in school. But I remember I had, like, one talk on just, like, don't play, don't talk to strangers on some <laughs> like, Yeah. I know yeah. that there's a lot like Don't talk to strangers on Club Penguin. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but where do you think kind of this will be taught and like how will it be brought to all of yeah. the learning agents? Great question. I will probably um, never stop being on the soapbox of like mass public service campaigns. I was just talking about this, you know, only you can prevent forest fires, right? Like those things are funny, but you remember them. And it's like, why is there like nothing even attempting to kind of broach this topic of what happens online matters offline or how to be a good digital citizen or Katie knows I'm in meetings with her all the time like public service campaigns are what we need so I don't know but I do think that like digital literacy should be part of curriculum I have no idea why it's not in 2023 um yeah great question I have no answer <laughs> When we asked in your research, have you looked at the types of games played that lead to diffusion groups? Mm. Um, you said that online was salient, but does it matter if it was something like a shooter or battle royale versus something right. more collaborative uh, in MMO or something? Yeah, that's a great question, Remy. Um, in the identity fusion work, we did 
look at it in two different gaming environments. We looked at Call of Duty versus Minecraft. And the reason we did that, our hypothesis was, was a more toxic competitive environment might more foster this profile of fusion. Um, and so we had them assess how toxic their communities were. Call of Duty was rated as more toxic than, than Minecraft, was less toxic. And when we did the model, it, it was true. We saw this more extreme profile among Call of Duty players than we saw among Minecraft players. And then like any good researcher, we said, no, wait, there's more variables here. Um, like Call of Duty is kind of political and you know is also a first person shooter. And, and so we're not exactly sure how to tease apart what that actually means, but it does suggest that there are differences to be had in different communities. I was very convinced that it was just the social environment, but then the more I learned, the more I realized that content really does have an impact and can be the, the mood music, right? That, that fosters this from happening. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, I wonder if I have that slide or if I, I had like 10,000 slides and then I cut them for time. Oh, I have, there we go. This is a really good paper. It came out of the Polaris Game uh, Work Summit workshop. It's down there, Polaris Game Summit. I think, um, recently, and it was talking about creating kind games. And so this paper is actually really good because it broke down like the ethical considerations, the monetary considerations, the community considerations, and really presented a business case for creating games um, that foster collaboration and kinder interaction with each other. So that would be one example. The other example, um, is red teaming, which is something Alex and I talk about. So there was this um, marketing campaign, it was called the Punch a Nazi campaign that came out before Wolfenstein 2 came out. And it, it was very clear, it was like, there is no other side, hashtag like Nazis GTFO. And it was like this little clip of like the guy like punching a Nazi. So they're trying to get ahead of this narrative, like these are the bad guys, like we don't like them. Um, and it got a lot of good press and kind of really like got in front of, of it being used for perhaps nefarious purposes. It was very clear where the developer stood on this line when he talked about this game and this content. So those are two examples of kind of safety by design. So thinking about how you can change the marketing or how you can change the design or like with Far Cry 5, making it more clear they're the bad guys. Like it really is kind of morally ambiguous because like the good guys in the game are also kind of like doomsday prepper type people. So it's not like super clear, like are you both the same or like is there really a good or a bad? Um, so kind of red teaming the narrative um, of games as well. But that Polaris uh, report, I'll put it back up. That's um, a really good place to start because it's very in depth. If I can find it, there it is. No, please, please go over. Yeah. I have a question. I'm sorry. Um, have you looked at similar media about, for example, Fox News? <laughs> I no, but I'm sure there'd be some interesting things there, sir. Um, no, I haven't. I have drawn from other, oh man, I took all the slides out. I have drawn from other media looking at um, the approaches to narratives. Like there's been some work from the Pop Culture Collective looking at the way that narratives are expressed in more traditional forms of media and how that is kind of used to impact the way we see and interact with the world and kind of compare it to what we're talking about with games now. But I haven't seen or done any work specifically looking um, at that. But you know, there is an argument to be made that games reflect culture, but I do think that games also create culture. So I think there's a bit of a cyclical thing happening. One last question. Sure. Um, I will speak for a little while. So, okay. Um, so Pat says, hi Rachel, thanks so much for your talk. How much of the radicalization that occurs in game spaces might you attribute to a reluctance from developers, studios, publishers, social media platforms to explicitly denounce such right wing extremism? It is a difficult question. I think that gaming <laughs> was a very pointed question. I think that gaming companies make a lot of efforts 
in a broad general sense, but not like this exact specific sense. So I do think that the reluctance to explicitly say, this is white supremacy, like even just that, like this content is white supremacy or using the word white nationalist versus using the word alt-right, which is a word kind of made to make it seem softer, these ideologies. I do think that that is a problem. I think if you ask somebody in, in leadership, do you denounce it or do you not think this is okay? I think they'd very clearly tell you like, this is not okay. Um, it's just the, the overarching, I guess, I wouldn't say reluctance, but just it hasn't happened unactioned. Um, doing that is definitely a problem. It's definitely a problem. Because um, like in many instances, the demographic most vulnerable to radicalization, young white males be understood as invisible markets of the industry. How might a mm. alienate such a market? Um, well, market? yeah, so that is a big question. So the business case for actually moderating and removing extremism, uh, there seems to be this on uh, this assumption that you would be alienating your target base rather than the acknowledgement that actually you would be bringing in an entire new one. Constance actually did some great work on this where um, she asked how much money would you be willing to spend on a game that is highly toxic versus not and people are willing to spend more money on communities that are not toxic. So yes, maybe some people won't want to be in a kind <laughs> space, um, but you'd be bringing in a lot more people like there's certain games that I absolutely won't play because of the reputation of the community within it. So that's like lost market value, right? People won't even engage. And the average gamer is 33 and women make up 48%. So your target audience is not a 14 year old man, even though the stereotype would have you believe it is. And that's players, not gamers, <laughs> but that's your market share. So players is what the market share is. Yeah. Well, I have a question prior. Um, when we're looking into cultures within like game development companies, yes. and stuff like that, has there been research or more internal um, perspective of perspective on how like devs themselves might be exposed or enabling mm -hmm. other purposely or subliminally toxic and oh, anti yeah. um, ideologies like? Oh, this thing in Far Cry Five. How much it was actually kind of purposeful? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I wish Alex was here because he's more of the expert on the extremist content. But there's a book called The Turner Diaries, which is like um a very important book to white supremacists. Um, and he says like the narrative of Far Cry Five, it's almost as if they were inspired by that book. Like it's, it has a lot of similarities between the content. Not that it necessarily was. Not saying that Ubisoft. I'm just saying there are parallels um, between the content. But red teaming would solve that problem. Um, yeah, they, they call it men, men first bro culture, I think is the phrase to describe. Bro, yeah. um, and, and there is research um, about that. It's not my particular area of expertise, but there, there is research that exists about how, you know, it's like startup culture and, and gaming culture has become kind of the, the norm within those work environments and how that might percolate out into the content that's being created. Because if the people making games are, men of a certain age, of a certain background, the content they make is going to cater to that. That makes sense. Um, but rise of the indie, so we're okay. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm doing. Sure, well, thank you all for coming.